Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the legal and government correspondent, and uh, we have entered another election cycle uh, for 2023 in the spring elections. We have a Supreme Court race. In effect, we have a primary and a general. Um, and one, our very first candidate to be interviewed is uh, Judge Everett Mitchell. Your Honor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jamie. I appreciate it. Uh, you being able to invite me on, and I'm glad to celebrate the first day of Black History with you uh, on your show today. Yes, I, I really appreciate the promptness with which you replied to us when we reached out to you and your eagerness to, to come on and, and um, you know, be able to answer questions. We try to have an exposure over Western Wisconsin and other parts of the state, and I know it's a little tougher. Uh, it's about a three and a half hour drive from uh, Madison uh, to uh, Hudson. So uh, let's start with um, just an introduction because you know a lot of folks will be seeing you for the first time and hearing from you. They may have read about you, but um, tell the folks a little bit about your background, whether personal, family, professional, wherever you wanna go with that, okay? Well, thank you so much. And I will say that, you know, this summer I spent a lot of time in Hudson and West, Western Wisconsin this summer. It's kind of getting a chance to speak to voters. And so I really enjoy the beauty and the niceness of so many people in, in the western part of our state. So I'm um, Judge Everett Mitchell. I'm a Dane County Circuit Court judge. I've been elected twice here in Dane County. I'm the presiding judge of our juvenile division. So I have administrative responsibilities of cases that involve children who have been removed from home, juvenile delinquency, family court cases, civil cases, as well as probate and small claims. I also oversee our high-risk drug court program here in Dane County, working with men and women who have opiate uh, substance use disorders and criminal charges. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School, where I teach courses on race, racism, and the law, and juvenile justice administration. And I'm senior pastor of Christ of Solid Rock Church, the only open and affirming congregation in Dane County. You know, part of my story is just this, that I grew up the son of a single mother, I grew up, uh, didn't know my father growing up. Uh, my mom married a guy who abused my family and my sisters for over 12 years. And we spent a lot of time trying to get help. And when we finally did, I was 18 years old in college, started at six uh, and didn't stop to 18. And I was functionally illiterate. I got a call one day after I had accepted a job bagging groceries to come to college. And I, nobody in my family had been to college. So I said, you know, no, I got a job bagging groceries. And the lady said something that made sense to an 18 year old. She said, why don't you come try college and give it a try. If you don't go, if you don't work out, you can always go back to bagging groceries. So I took her challenge, went home, put everything in my trunk and just went to college and failed everything because that's when it really was exposed that I could not read. But as I was putting on my backpack, getting ready to head out, two teachers, Miss Margaret Bell and Miss Daisy Wilson pulled me to the side and said, Everett, we don't want you to give up on your dream of a higher education and graduate from college. So they taught me how to read. They taught me how to study at 18 years old. They taught me how to organize notes. They taught me the discipline of going to the library from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. every day, putting my boom box on my shoulder. And if, you're, if your listeners know what boom box is, we're in the same age bracket with them big D batteries. And I went from making a 1.5 to a 4.0 in that same semester. And then that allowed for me to work hard and transfer to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, which was the college of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then make my way to Princeton and get two master's degrees from Princeton. And then eventually make my way to the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School and earn my Juris Doctorate working as a single father, full-time, still doing law review and still graduated in three years. So those are a little bit of things about me. I'm a father. I have a 17-year-old that's a sophomore in college. I have a 10-year-old. You do the math on that, but she's an exceptionally smart kid. I have a 10-year-old that's running around the house like crazy all the time beautiful wife uh, and a dog named Bailey. So those are kind of personal things and all of that experiences of where I've come from really do fuel my perspective of how I've done my job as a Dane County Circuit Court judge. And it's those lenses that I wanna be able to bring to, uh, to the Supreme Court. Excellent. Well, uh, I learned something about you uh, already and uh, found out that we've got something in common, you know, first one to graduate from college in your family. So. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the work that goes into doing that. Yeah, congratulations um, on that, man. Yeah, I yeah. know that's that's not easy. Well, except I, I went to law school a little before you. I think, uh, yeah, I, I graduated law school, I think, um, before you were born. But uh, 
seventy seven. You you graduated before seventy seven. Oh, 77? Oh, okay. No, I'm, I missed. I, I'm sorry. I was off on the math there. You're oh. the mathematician. That was one of your uh, majors, right? Yes, it was. Mathematics okay, and so you exposed my, my bad math there. But um, let's get back to talking about you because you're running for the highest office in the Wisconsin judiciary. Yes. Um, why do you feel you're qualified to do that? Well, one, once you've been elected twice to the Dane County, you know, the Dane County Circuit Court, you spend time learning and understanding the rule of law, right? So you understand about making decisions for cases. So I have the basis of understanding what the judiciary goes through, what the district courts, circuit courts go through, and be able to write decisions that are big issues that impact everyday Wisconsinites lives. Not only that, but I've also had administrative responsibilities. So being the head of the juvenile justice, juvenile division allows me to have uh, understand, you know, systems from a bigger perspective. So not only am I responsible for what happens in my courtroom, but I'm also responsible for bigger systems and what that means for bigger systems and providing leadership for our entire community at the same time. And I think when we get ready to transition to you know, our Supreme Court, what it needs is not only people who understand the rule of law, but also understand the role of leadership, because many people don't understand that the Supreme Court doesn't just simply you know, address cases. They also have leadership, general, general jurisdiction over courts throughout our entire state, appellate courts, circuit courts, and they set the agenda for judicial education. They set the agenda related to, uh, you know, the kinds of committees that are being brought together for us to explore. And they set the tempo for how courts and resources and budgeting is done for our courts. I think I've had experience doing all of those things. And quite honestly, I just think our court needs a different set of experiences that, that we don't currently have right now. And so, you know, those are the qualifications. And, you know, I teach at law school, so I teach law school students. So I understand the law and big constitutional questions that we have to answer and how to, how to better impact uh, the legal profession. And I think, you know, being on the court will give us an opportunity to not only adjust and address the rules of law, but also provide leadership that I think our state needs to move our state forward and not backwards. Well, another area where we have commonality is former prosecutor, and you were a prosecutor in Dane County. Um, how did that prepare you for being on the bench? Man, we ought to be twins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we ought to go on the show called Jamie and Everett, you know, so much in common. I think the, uh, I think, I don't know if being a prosecutor, you know, assists me to be on the bench. I think more specifically, after I became a prosecutor and I started working as a pro bono attorney, that's when I really started to learn about the ways in which people were treated. So I don't think you get that feeling when you, you know, you're doing the prosecutorial, you have that discretion, you have the power, you have the weight of the state behind you. But when you start representing people who are poor and indigent and don't have resources and, uh, you know, whether they black or white or you know, mental health challenges and they're trying to access the court that's when you realize okay this 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 is really not fair this, this is very unequal like making people come to court take off work to come to court for like 10 minutes nothing gets done after they've taken a whole day off work child care i think that experience really informed my perspective of what the court system especially circuit courts must have must become in order to make sure that families receive you know equity and fairness inside the court okay so um, you have, though, experience from both the bench and the bar looking at the justice system, and you're making decisions as a circuit court judge, pe people spending time in getting incarcerated or under supervision, taking children out of their homes, putting them back in homes and reuniting families. Yes. Um, but you won't have that opportunity, that kind of direct impact on the Supreme Court. So why, you know, how do you see your ability to impact justice if you were on the Supreme Court versus the circuit court, which is more the front lines? Yeah, so that's very interesting is that, you know, we continue to think that Supreme Court justices just kind of sit back and rule cases. My, my mentor was Justice Shirley Abrahamson. Now, I don't know, you said you interviewed her on your show before. You know, yeah. she was not a justice who just sat back in her black robe she was having her little small, tall self going around this entire state. So when she was the one who encouraged me, like when I fought to get the handcuffs off of children, I had this time when we were at a judicial education college and somebody needed to bring Justice Abrahamson back. 
And I was in the car driving, you know, like driving just as Abrahamson. And I was like, you know, railing, oh, how hard it is. We should be taking handcuffs. And there's so much pressure in people. And she leaned over, she touched my hand and she said, Judge, if you think it was hard, what do you think it was like being a small Jewish woman going up against a whole bunch of men? We don't give up and we keep fighting. So nobody would say that she never made an impact. The fact that you have six uh, women who identify as women on the, on the Supreme Court now suggest that you continue to do work in communities to support the narrative of communities changing. So for me, you know, everybody may have their priorities. You have justices right now that go to all kinds of events and spend time with all kinds of groups. My groups might be farmers who I really enjoy getting to meet now. I enjoy me going to, you know, urban areas, 53206, going into schools and showing them what a judge can look like because what they see is what they will be. So we want to change narratives, both in urban and rural communities. You have to be present for them to ask questions and for them to get to know you and you know them. And that makes a better relationship, both, you know, rural, tribal communities, urban communities. And that to me, will continue to make sure that our impact is made. I mean, just the fact that they will see somebody that looks like me will change a whole nother narrative that this state has never seen or elected in 175 years. All right, so let's get into your judicial philosophy then, because as cases come to the Supreme Court, uh, they've already been through uh, at least one level of courts, the circuit we, court, and we hope, sometimes we they hope. bypass exactly. the, we the hope. appellate court. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, usually the, the case has already been examined by multiple eyes from a judicial perspective. What would be your judicial philosophy when you approach decisions on cases? So I, I firmly believe that anybody who is listening to cases need to be, have bifocus. And I call it bifocus it means you really have to have two lenses. You have to have an originalist lens and you have to have a living document lens. Can I explain both of those to you why I say that? Sure. See, I think about, the, you know, my favorite decision to always read is Brown versus Board of Education. And when Thurgood Marshall and NAACP challenged Plessy versus Ferguson, they did it two ways. They used an originalist approach that approached the, you know, 14th Amendment and its ratification in 1866 as a way to say the originalist intent was to provide due process and equal protection of the law so that everybody has the same thing, right? But they were applying that originalist interpretation to a living situation of segregation that was literally destroying the ability for, you know, uh, you know, children to get equal access to educational tools like other white children were being accessed to. So they used an originalist approach, but then applied it to a current day situation to get an outcome that was able to, you know, see that the precedent needed to be overturned, right? And overturning that precedent set a new standard for how communities would then move forward. Now, we know that there were always some pushbacks in other communities, but for the most part, as a constitutional standard, by overturning, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown was then, you know, extracting to them that the original intent also meant for us to be able to look forward to what we want our society to look forward and how they decided Plessy was no longer the standard anymore for how we were going to move forward with our legal jurisprudence. So for me, you have to have a bifocal approach. Anybody who just says they pick one really d diminishes, I think, the power of the Constitution and her amendments. At the same time, if you're too, too forward thinking and thinking about living, you're never respecting the ability for us to really get a rooting of what the original intent was for the words that were written. And there's power in the original intent in those words. Well, when we talk philosophy, I hear um, at least one of the other candidates, maybe another one, uh, that describe themselves as conservative constitutionalists or constitutional conservatives. I'm, I guess they flip those words sometimes, but um, I'm sure the folks, uh, the, the j justices that decided Plessy versus Ferguson, which was separate but equal doctrine, mm -hmm. thought of themselves as conservative constitutionalists. So how do you, uh, how do you respond to those folks who say the only, uh, correct constitutional interpretation is original uh, interpretation. Again, I say that, you know, we're missing, uh, we're missing the, uh, the actual ways in which we evolve. I think the, I don't think anybody would that consider the Brown versus Board of Education court a quote unquote living constitutionist. I think they saw themselves as originalists going back to the originalists, but also applying it to a factual situation that sat in front of them. So, 
I don't know exactly what they mean when they say, you know, you know, conservative. I don't know what they mean by that and what they're trying to construct. That's not even a language of the Constitution itself. That's something we've made up, you know, uh, here in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. But the idea is to be committed to the rule of law as it stands, to have some respect for precedent, for understanding that precedent does generally allow for some stability for the rule of law so that people know what to expect as it relates to our broader federal uh, constitutional standards. To, to deviate from that means that you have to have a factual scenario that really justifies moving away from the precedent that has been set before. And you know, when we think about how we interpret, I think the interpretation, you know, the ways in which we come at the Constitution really allows for a more in-depth discussion uh, when it comes to you know, what that majority decision uh, may render. Well, and if I may, I guess uh, other candidates or, or folks uh, from one political spectrum side or the other would think that you need to apply the law as a judge, not make the law. Do you generally agree with that? Yeah, we should not be in the business of making laws. You know, that's not the role of a judge. It's unfortunate that when you have legislative and executive branches that are argumentative to the degree in which they cannot resolve basic questions like, should we wear a mask? You know, should the ballot, you know, should the ballot box be used? Should the ballot box not get used? And those questions are not getting answered in the, the you know, the representative governments for which people have elected individuals to do, it gets left up to the Supreme Court. And I'm quite honestly, Supreme Courts don't have, that's not the tools of the court to be trying to do legislation from the bench. We, what, how, are we supposed, how are we supposed to legislate when we're only supposed to be going off facts for which we can't even have enough hearings to get all of the facts to determine uh, you know, what we're supposed to follow and what is the standard of law related to finding it. So when, when courts are left up to that, it demonstrates that our democracy is broken and is not functioning in a manner that is consistent with what our founders uh, wanted it to be established to do. Now, uh, the Supreme Court race in April is in April when all the nonpartisan races are held. Despite um, that um, characterization as nonpartisan, we still have tons of political groups that are getting into the business of electing folks and spending money and so forth. And they start throwing around labels, liberal and conservative. Um, how do you come down on that whole notion of the how judicial elections are run and political influence? I think as far back as 1993, people have been talking about the Re reformation of the judicial education process. I can tell you that you know running on the, in the in the circuit court is a little different. You know, that's you got your own small community. But when you talk about having to raise, come on, Jamie, man, you know, you're a first time college graduate. If they're talking about raising, you know, you know, five million, ten million dollars out of people's pockets in order to run races, you're asking people to almost be beholden to special interest groups the entire time. It puts you in a position where you're trying to raise money. And in order to get ads on TV, you have to raise this money a certain kind of way. And doing that could ultimately compromise your ability to be fair and impartial. And I think we have to reform that process so that people can actually do the job without feeling like they have pressure to keep the job from these outside groups that will spend against you or for you if you are able to give a tick in their direction of how you might rule. The moment that we start, somebody has their thumb on the, the label. I, I, love the, I, I love the seal. I wish your Western listeners could look at the seal of the uh, Supreme Court because the seal has... You know, it's like a hand holding the balance. Mm -hmm. And it just depends now. It's supposed to be justice is holding that balance, but it seems like when there's so much money in it, it's not justice that's holding that balance. It's a whole, bunch, a whole bunch of other interest groups that are holding that balance. And that that is something we have to take under consideration. If we really want that stuff out of us, there might be a reformation of the process by which we, you know, we get judges onto our higher court. You mentioned the lenses with which you would view uh, cases and apply the law. What are some of the values, jurisprudence values that you would bring uh, to the table when you're deciding things with the six other justices on the Wisconsin Supreme Court? Well, obviously, you know, I, I do respect the, you know, you have to start with, you know, a reading of both the, the federal constitution as well as state constitution. I'm a big proponent that, you know, you gather facts from the briefs that are being set, set before you, 
you make sure that the arguments that are being presented to you that you don't try to bring outside facts into your discussion because if they're not already introduced as evidence you don't want to be bringing in things outside of the actual briefs that are there to be presented as evidence uh, so you want to make sure you're disciplined in that arena right so i think sometimes what makes individuals not trust the process is because you get this dictum that is written and in, written inside of these decisions that in many ways they're pulling from out it feels like they're pulling from outside sources in order to kind of craft this decision and it's not within the record itself so you have to, you have to be very disciplined to stay within the record when you're writing decisions and not allow all the other you know things that you may be aware of because you're watching other media media forms and all these other things that come before you to dictate and decide your capacity to 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 make a decision in front of you so you know, I, I'm very disciplined as a judge, even as a circuit court judge, I write decisions. I focus on, you know, the fact that I have 99% approval rating. I've not, you know, been overturned, but once, uh, and because I write decisions, it's a discipline to making sure that you write decisions. You just don't give oral stuff off the top of your mouth, but that you sit down, take what is the standard of law that you're using, what are the facts that have been presented to you and how you are applying the facts uh, to the law that you have set as a standard that for your review. And most of that should come from briefs and then you just take the facts and go from there. Now you've been uh, out there, uh, campaign declared yourself candidate months ago, correct? Yes, I did. All right, and along the way, um, you know, you get slapped with a label, liberal or conservative. Do you, do you agree with the, the liberal label that I read in some of the articles that describe the race, uh, you and one other uh, candidate, and then there's two that are considered conservative? I think that's the problem, Jamie. Right, This is nonpartisan. So they, they find ways not to talk about it in Republican-Democrat terms. But that's what they're doing. It's still cold for Republican, you Republican people, you Democrat people, which ultimately weakens our capacity to be open to all people's points of view. So my, like you said, I've been out since you know June, and really before that, I was going around the state, spending time with so many different groups. And what I continue to go to is, you know, those labels hurt the ability to have a conversation or people to listen to you to be able to actually understand your point of view. So these labels, they may work in the media, but it destroys the integrity of the conversation that we need to have in order to further you know, a democracy that's rooted in a third branch of government. If we don't, if, if, if we get turned off, so the moment that you say that, you know, you don't, I don't get invited to the the other forums, you know, I don't get, you know, get interviews from other groups because they've already said, now nah, we're just going to, you know, keep them over there. But I'd be open to have any conversation. Some of the most intriguing conversations that I've had that allows me to understand, you know, the mind and hearts of Wisconsinites have come from, you know, Republican places that are generally Republican and we sitting in bars having conversations and they teach me about the issues that are of concern to them and they show me what they are concerned about and it's my job to listen and to be able to say you know what there's, va there's validity and strength in your voice and I need to make sure that they're that they're doing so these labels I mean it just it it, it, it erodes it erodes our conversations and I have I'm, I'm sad well, that this is the state of our democracy at times. Well, we always want voters, you know, to do their research rather than just chase a label. And so at the end of the interview, we're going to give you that opportunity to let folks know how to get, learn more about you. But uh, before we get there, we just wanted to ask, are there any endorsements of uh, folks of your campaign, of your race, of your candidacy mm -hmm. that you are particularly proud of or that you embrace? Yeah, so I love the the block endorsement that I received, you know, all, all the way back in August, because it's black communities, you know, organizing black, black leaders organized for communities. And the reason why is because it was a space where I went into, you know, the area 53206. For your Western Wisconsinites, it is the most incarcerated uh, zip code in our entire state, 53206. So I go into that space. And what I offer them is what I just do in Dane County for our children. And you could feel the tears and the emotions in that room because so many of them have been denied justice and equality and fairness. And they never heard a judge talk about trauma-informed care, mental health services, love, embracing young people, embracing families, bringing them back together, or using their power to really make sure that everybody is treated correctly and fairly in their presence. So having them embrace me was a way for me to say, all right, they understand how important this is 
And not only are we talking about, you know, yes, reproductive choice, which came down and, you know, fair maps and voting, but we're also talking about access to justice and how so many people in our state have been denied access to that, the realm of justice because, you know, they don't have the same amount of money. They don't, they don't have access. They don't have privilege. But even though they don't have those things, they still should be given the opportunity to be seen and heard and find justice in that place. So that's one that I have really celebrated and I'm excited to be able to have because they work for me and they know I will work for them. And I got a limited couple of minutes here, but it, are there any issues and you know, some candidates are very hesitant to say where they stand on some of the issues, but just overall issues that come forward, whether it's access to the ballot, uh, reproductive rights, et cetera, uh, any that you feel are critical to this part will be you know, decided potentially in the next year uh, by the new court following this election. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where the processes are that, you know, in terms of these cases or fair maps, but I do recognize that there's a lot of energy around, you know, reproductive choice, trying to get some finality to the 1849 uh, law that's on the books now and what that then means. There's going to have to be some interpretation around that. I don't know what that case is. I don't know the briefs on that case. Obviously, I grew up, you know, since you noted my age, I grew up in 19, you know, 19, 1977. I grew up in an era where Roe was the standard for reproductive choice my, my entire life. So it is very difficult for me to think about a world that's, that's not the case. So we're just trying to, you know, there's a lot of landscapes that are going to be forced back to the states. We're talking about reproductive choice now. I think ICWA will come back in the Child Welfare Act because that's before the Supreme Court. I think we will have to act on affirmative action because I think that will come back to the states. And I think once we get to June, we'll see if the Supreme Court accepts the independent state legislature theory, which will basically invalidate a court's ability to check a legislator's uh, legislation's ability to set what is happening with voter rights in their, in their state. Okay. Well, um, so final uh, 30 seconds on a speech on why should voters choose you over the other three candidates? Well, I go with this idea of voters in Western Wisconsin that justice is not simply what you say, it's what you do. You want to elect somebody who's actually committed themselves to doing justice. So whether I have worked to reduce recidivism for men and women coming out of prison from 70 percent down to 15 percent, working hard to change the rules related to CCAP so that people who have a charge that is dismissed or found not guilty or an eviction that is dismissed can be removed or fighting to take handcuffs off of children and putting a trauma-informed perspective leadership model in place such that we were able to reduce juvenile car thefts referrals in our community by 47%. We were able to go down from four judges to three in our juvenile division because we no longer had the cases to justify them. And 85% of our young people don't come back. So yes, I'm a former prosecutor and I do criminal charges, but I recognize that I'm not gonna brag about how many people I've locked up. I'm gonna brag about how many futures I saved. And saving futures means you don't have any more victims and you're saving the taxpayers of our state money. And that is what I think justice and leadership is supposed to be in our state. All right, very good. So in conclusion, how can folks uh, learn more about Everett Mitchell's run for the Supreme Court? Yes, you can go to www.judgemitchellforjustice.com. And there's a whole bunch of videos and articles that have been written over my judicial career. So you get a clear sense of all the great things I can't talk about here. There's also on the website 20 top things that Everett Mitchell has contributed to the state. So you can get a chance to see about the additional work that I've done uh, to support the what I believe is the beauty of Wisconsin. And can I just say this last thing, Jamie? Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't born in Wisconsin, but I chose it. And I chose it to place to raise my children because the values that I've begun to appreciate throughout our entire state are values that deserve being protected and our society will be better when we have people who show the diversity of what experiences they bring to our state because Wisconsin is a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful state. Thank you. You bet. And uh, I wanna thank you, Judge Mitchell, for being willing to be a, a guest on our show and be able to let voters know a little bit more about you. I encourage our voters and viewers to get out there, do your research and make sure you vote. The primary is February 
19th? 21st. 21st. 20, man, 21st. Hey, yeah. hey, get that right, Well, man. there might be early voting, right? Uh, <laughs> hey, there's going to be early voting, but the primary is make sure you vote by February 21st. Yeah, Tuesday. February 21st. It's very late this year, the, the primary, and then the general will be April 4th. So uh, yep. good luck with the race, and I want to tell our viewers, keep watching. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you all so much.